celebrate your victory with holy hymns and to proclaim your might with pure tongues. We thank you for your love and we worship you crying out, Christ is risen, he is truly risen. To you be glory to your Father and to your Holy Spirit now.
forgiveness. We worship you, for you have brought us close to your Father. You enriched us by your birth, purified us by your baptism. You sanctified us by your crucifixion. You reconciled us to the Father by your resurrection. You raised us up by your ascension. And you adorned us with the gifts of your spirit of holiness. Now, Lord, receive our incense and fill us always with your sweet fragrance, so that our tongues may never cease in giving thanks to you. deny him, 
he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Praise be to God always. Suddenly, while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? And they stopped, looking downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, are you the only stranger to Jerusalem who does not know of these things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? And they said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and our rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we had been hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. And some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And they did not find his body. And they came back and they reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and they found the things just as the women had described them. But him they did not see. And he said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? 
And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he would continue farther on. And they urged him, Remain with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is far advanced. And so he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and he gave it to them. And with that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he was hidden from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? And so they set out at once, and they returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven, and those with them. And who among themselves were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon, who recounted what had taken place on the way, and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise the Lord. St. Paul's life. So last night, we really kind of looked at the poignancy of this letter, this last moment to write to Timothy again. It's the second letter to Timothy. Timothy who's at Ephesus. But St. Paul is writing from the dungeon now in Rome. When you finish the Acts of the Apostles and read, you find St. Paul in prison or under arrest, but it's a house arrest. This is another arrest taking place in Rome, and this is going to end with his death, his martyrdom. He will be decapitated at the one mile mark, marker outside the city. So he's writing to his son, he's been lost everything. The only one he says who is with him is St. Luke. And Timothy is the overseer, the bishop. He's leading the small flock in Ephesus. And in this letter, there's not a lot of new doctrine or any kind of expounding because St. Paul is confident that Timothy has the grasp of the apostolic faith. So there's no need to elaborate doctrine. So what you have is the poignancy of an old man, even though he's probably around 70, 67, 65, for the time of course he's certainly an old man. And at the end of his life after preaching for the gospel, preaching the gospel for decades now, following our Lord's ascension. But what we also have in this section today being read is a reflection of the baptismal ceremonies. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we've died with him, we will rise with him. He seems to be quoting a hymn, probably of something that is used or part of the ceremony for baptism already in that generation in the 60s. And what he's doing in this section, it's a very easy text to read. A lot of complications to it. So that he says that I'm in prison and I'm shackled like an evildoer. But the word of God is not chained. The word of God is not shackled. And so in that kind of confidence of hope, he's reminding 
us of the threefold aspect of our lives. Remember, all the sacraments are past, present, and future. They all commemorate the events, they all make present the events of our redemption from the past. They bring us grace in the present moment of transformation. And they also orient us towards the fulfillment of this redemption when our Lord's appearance at the end of time. Past, present, and future. All of the sacraments, all of the mysteries, the entire life of the church is the simultaneity of past, present, and future. And so what he's reminding us here is that our Christian lives in the present are meant to be the face of Christ. Of course our redemption has been worked. And so in this baptismal image he uses is that if we've died with him, if we have descended with him into the waters, and we rise with him, that aspect, if we have died with him, we have also risen with him. And our life is meant to be the manifestation of Christ day after day. That's a huge responsibility. It's not just about in the gospel about what we get. It's about what we become, what we are meant to be. And the life of the church is the fulfillment and the reality of the face of Christ. And we sing the Kaddishat. You are holy. Kaddish. At. At is you. Kaddish is holy. Holy are you. And when we sing this, we often mention this is about the Christ. This is not a Trinitarian image in the heavens. This is Christ who is the face of the hidden Father, who is the reality and the manifestation of God among us. You are holy. And that reality and the extension of the body of Christ is that each member who has died with Christ and risen with Him, each member is meant to be the face of Christ. The same way that Christ is the face of the Father. Our daily responsibilities, how we speak, what we do, how we work, how we interact with the people around us, they're all meant to be Christ. And our Lord insists upon the fact that when we see the other person, we are meant to see Christ. Now we'll read about this in the lives of the saints. We'll see this different aspect of these miraculous graces that are given. But those are only given to the church in order to remind us of what the reality is meant to be at every moment of every day, of every week, of every month, until we die. And that's why this quotation of this hymn or prayer or whatever that it seems to be with the ceremony of baptism at the time, that not only have we died with Him, if we've died with Him, we have also risen with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us cannot walk away from something that we've embraced, which is the eternal presence of God within this world. And he says, but even if we deny Him, even if we are unfaithful, He will not deny Himself, because He is all faithful. He is faithful to Himself. Again, that face of God means that it is the face of eternal truth. And so St. Paul is writing to Timothy, and Timothy himself in a number of years is going to be beaten to death in martyrdom in Ephesus. Be beaten to death with pagan symbols of idolatry during a religious festival in Ephesus. And it's a reminder so that when he says that I'm shackled, I'm chained as if I was an evildoer, he's not complaining about, it's not a why me. He's simply saying that this is the fact of how the world reacts to grace. It hates it. And if the world loves you, that's a really bad sign. If you are comfortable in this world, and you are content just where you're at and just the way things are, I don't mean you want to raise, that's different. But if you're comfortable in the way the world functions and thinks and acts, that is a very bad sign. Because it means that the reality of Christ has disappeared in your life. Because the reality of Christ will always be in opposition. This is why the world rose up, Jew and pagan, rose up against the Messiah and put him to death. Because he represents and he is a reality that introduces an entire new history. We considered this last week. And that entrance of a new history is salvation. That is a life and a vision of a life of God within the world, which is completely different from the way the world thinks. 
Which is why Timothy himself, when he dies, is going, as I said, during a pagan religious festival, he is going to be beaten to death by the very religious symbols of the paganism. You could not have a more clear expression of what grace means in the world. It will always be in contrast. From the moment that this child was born into the world, there's a conflict. Remember Simeon, famously, around the baby. The baby is 40 days old. That this child is for a sign of the rise and the fall of many in Israel, and a sign to be contradicted. This reality is what we receive when we are baptized. And St. Paul says, I'm in chains, because this is what the world does to the apostles. It kills them. But the Word of God is endless, and is substantial truth, and will always be faithful to itself, and will always bring life. So the Word of God is not shackled. The Word of God is not chained. And then he says, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Now, we could do a whole sermon just on who are the elect. What is it, the chosen ones? Who are these people? And maybe someday we will. But he says that reality, the elect for us today, is just to understand the destiny of those who are going to embrace that grace and who are going to flourish in eternal glory. That's all we need to understand today. That's the elect. These individuals, he says, I suffer everything for the sake of the chosen ones, of the elect, that they may find the salvation in Christ Jesus and finish in eternal glory. It's a very simple idea, but it is the underlying aspect of what we call predestination. And this aspect of being the elect is why St. Paul says you won't stop this. Those who are destined to become part of God's presence are before the presence of God in eternal glory. This will happen. And therefore, I put up with everything the world can throw at me. Everything that the world can do, I endure for the sake of the elect. And then he quotes this section on this beautiful hymn. So for us, as we begin this third week of the resurrection, we need to stop and think about our lives. Where are they? Where should they be? My interactions with the people around me and the way I work and the way I go to school and the way I deal with the people around me, is it really totally infused by that resurrection, by the Christ? Is everyone that I meet, do I see Christ in them? It's easy to see Christ in the sacraments. It's easy to see Christ in the church. But when I leave, when I go forth in peace, as the church gives us to send us back into the world, to go in peace, do I take that peace, do I take that reality with me? Or am I more or less like everyone else in the world, but I just say the rosary on occasion? Or is there really a transformation of me fundamentally inward out? This is what this small text means today. So as always, I encourage you, this second letter to St. Timothy. It's not very long, it's small. And when you read it, put it in understanding of the poignancy of the old man finishing his days shortly before his martyrdom, writing to the next generation of the church, which is who Timothy represents and is the reality of. And then we turn to the Lord God to ask for the strengthening of our faith, the encouragement to give us the ability to be the face of Christ, because our lives are never fulfilled in the Christian image in the present. The fulfillment of our life as Christians will only take place on the last day, which is why you see in all of our anaphoras, they always talk about the last day, the last day, the end of the world, the appearance of Christ. That's when the reality of the gospel will finally find its full flourishing. In our individual lives, it's when they will find their fulfillment of what we labor under and endure from day to day. And these mysteries of past, present, and future, that we are given great hope from the redemption that has been given to us, but we have a responsibility to be the face of Christ in this generation, but never to lose hope even when it seems to be only imprisonment and contradiction, because we also understand that the fulfillment is only in the future direction, and it's for that that we have hope, and for that that anchors us in this present moment, so that our lives themselves, then, when we understand this, becomes a sacrament. It becomes the reality of the past, 
It becomes the face of Christ in the present in the pursuit of holiness and virtue while we await the fulfillment of that glory of Christ on the last day. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ in his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint George. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy. Make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Savior inheritance when you appear at the end of 
time to reward all people justly according to their needs. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying,
we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo Elohim. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. 
Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. And we glorify and honor you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So as a reminder, as we get back to our normal schedule, there is muffins and coffee downstairs following the Mass. The second thing, as you know, I have gone to the Holy Lands in the last few weeks, and so I bring you back, you might have noticed the baskets, and then the servers took them back to the two doorways. So they are baskets filled with um, the olive wood rosaries that are made in Bethlehem. The boxes say Jerusalem, but I got them actually in Bethlehem. And so they have been both blessed and been part of the sacrifice of the Mass this morning. And they are my gifts to you. So on your way out, please make sure you take at least one of the rosaries as you go out. And you were with me at every shrine, every holy place, every place that we went for the two weeks, you were with me. So I carried you there as you carried me in your prayers as you were concerned watching CNN and the rest of the news broadcast of what was going on in Israel. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your prayers. And again, this is a gift and a reminder that I've prayed for you in all of these places in the Holy Lands. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. 